This video covers all the ways to separate chemistry, which are all the really, really cool bits. Transition metals are in the middle. Their properties are that they are hard, shiny, and are good conductors. These are basically your traditional metals, so any property of traditional metal, you can generally associate it with a transition metal. And um, because of their properties, they can be used in jewellery, in wires, or in saucepans. Um, and because they get all these different colours, they can be used for things like stained glass or for coating statues. Here the Statue of Liberty has a copper coating. Copper, uh, transition metal compounds are generally going to be blue or bluey green. Iron 2 is light green. Iron 3 is an orangey brown, a rust colour. And cobalt is a really lovely deep rich blue. For rusting to take place, we need to have iron, oxygen, and water, and that is going to result in iron oxide. You can see in my experiment here that the iron oxide is this brown, orangey red stuff that is on the sides. Rusting will actually lead to an increase in mass because you're taking the iron and you're adding in the oxygen. There are a couple of ways we can stop this from happening. We can um, galvanize things. We can coat things. We can use a sacrificial metal. In a pure metal, we have layers. These layers can slide, and because these layers can slide, a pure metal is very soft. An alloy has disrupted layers. which cannot slide and because they cannot slide it is very hard. To carry out titration first of all you need to put 25 centimeters cubed in an alkali into a conical flask, add a phenolphthalein indicator or an indicator like methyl orange, fill a burette with an acid of a known concentration, take the initial reading on the burette and record it and while swirling the flask, use the tap to slowly add, drop by drop, the acid into the alkali. When the first permanent colour change happens, pink to clear for phenolphthalein, stop adding the acid. Record the final volume in the yet and repeat titers until you get it within 0.05 cm3. For titration calculations, we first need to calculate the number of moles of acid you used. We can use this to find the number of hydrogen ions involved in the reaction. This is going to be equal to the number of hydroxide ions at the point of neutralisation. We can use this to calculate the number of moles of alkali used and concentrate the calculation of the acid. We have 25 centimetres cubed of alkali was neutralized by 15 centimeters cubed of 0.2 moles acid find the concentration of the alkali first thing i'm going to do is pull all the information out of the question concentration of the alkali is what we're trying to find volume of the alkali 25 centimeters cubed concentration of the acid 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed volume of the acid 15 centimeters cubed so the first thing we do is calculate the number of moles of acid used. So for the number of moles of acid used, we're going to use concentration of the acid times volume of the acid. That is 0.2 times the volume of the acid, which is 15, divided by 1,000 because we need it in decimeters cubed. So 0.2 times 0.015 giving us an answer of 0.003 moles. If we look at our balanced equation, we can see that acid and alkali are in a one-to-one -one ratio in this equation. 
So there's going to be an equal number of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. So we know that our moles of um, acid are 0 0.003 moles, which means our moles of alkali must also be 0 0.003 moles. Now we know the number of moles of alkali. We can use concentration by volume again, rearranging that because we know the moles and we know the volume to find the concentration. We can use moles equals concentration times volume again and rearranging that because we know our moles and we know our volume. So moles divided by volume will give us concentration. So our moles from we've just worked out is 0 0.003. Our concentration is 25 centimetres cubed divided that by 1,000 to get it in decimetres cubed. So that is going to be 0 0.003 divided by 0 0.025 giving us 0 0.12 moles per decimetre cubed as our concentration of alkali. To work out percentage yields, you need to take your actual yields and divide it by your theoretical yields. So if this is your actual yields, then your theoretical yield is how much you thought you were going to make. To work out your atom economy, that is your MR of atoms in the required products of your MR of reactants. or the MR of stuff you wanted over the MR of the stuff you actually got. When you are dealing with gases, what you need to remember is that one mole is always going to take up 24 decimeters cubed. Le Chatelier's principle tells us that whatever you do to a reversible reaction, the reaction will do the opposite. So in this reaction, this way is endothermic and this way is exothermic. So if you heat up a reaction, the endothermic reaction will increase to compensate and the exothermic reaction will decrease to compensate. Whereas if you decrease the temperature, then the endothermic reaction will decrease to compensate and the exothermic reaction will increase to compensate so that the overall temperature stays the same. If you're going to change the temperature or the concentration, the reaction will also adjust itself to compensate. If you are going to increase the pressure or the concentration, then the reaction will shift to the side that has less moles to compensate. If you're going to decrease, then it will shift to the side that has more moles to compensate. The Harbour process produces ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen gas. Our main source of nitrogen and hydrogen gas is getting them from the air. We can also get hydrogen gas from the electrolysis of water. They are fed into the reaction vessel where they will be turned into ammonia, which is a liquid, so that can be taken off at the bottom. And any unreacted gases can go back round into the reaction. It is done at 450 degrees C at 200 atmospheres and using an iron catalyst. The production of ammonia is very important because it is an important source of nitrogen for fertilisers. The conditions used in the harbour process are actually a compromise. The forward reaction is exothermic, so this tells us using Le Chatelier's principle of dynamic equilibrium that we should be using a low temperature if we want to dry the forward reaction. But at a low temperature, we have a low rate of reaction. So even though using the high temperature of 450 degrees drives the backwards reaction away from ammonia towards the production of the gas, the rate of reaction is so fast that it is constantly cycling between the two. So 450 degrees is a compromised temperature. The ammonia comes off as a liquid, so that can be taken off, that can be removed, which is also going to drive the forward reaction. There are less moles of product than there are moles of reactant. There are four over this side and two over this side. 
So high pressures of 200 atmospheres are going to drive the forward reaction because this is going to take up less space. There are less moles of it. A higher pressure would increase the rate of the forward reaction even more, but it would be dangerous because high pressure leads to risk of explosion. So 200 atmospheres is used because it is a relatively safe pressure to do it with. As we increase the pressure, the danger to the workers increases. The um, thickness of the walls increases, and also stuff like insurance costs are going to increase. Ammonium sulfate can be made from the reaction of ammonia and sulfuric acid or ammonium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. Fertilisers are good because they increase crop production, but they also lead to an increase in eutrophication. Here we have a simple cell with two different metals, copper and zinc, in their own solution. So here is zinc in zinc sulfate solution and copper in copper sulfate solution. They are connected by a salt bridge or an iron bridge and because zinc is higher in the electrochemical series it is going to push electrons this way towards copper. A flow of electrons means we are going to have a potential difference. So the zinc is going to be giving up electrons and the copper is going to be accepting electrons. That thing that we commonly refer to as a battery is actually a cell. I know, I know, it's really annoying. A cell is one battery. A battery is more than one cell. So this is a cell. And then two or more of them together would be a battery. In non-rechargeable batteries, the chemical reaction that produces electricity, once that is used up, the battery is dead. Whereas in a rechargeable battery, there is a reversible reaction that goes on. So once the reactants are used up, you can pass electricity through it, which will cause the reaction to go in the opposite direction, recharging the battery. In a hydrogen fuel cell, we just have hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas and turning into water. There is a large amount of energy released. Which can be used to power an electric car. And water is the only product. Which means there are no carbon emissions. There are a few problems with this, uh, predominantly with the production of hydrogen. At the moment this uses fossil fuels because hydrogen can either be made more acting steam with coal or natural gas, which are both fossil fuels. Or hydrogen is made by electrolysis of water, but that involves electricity, electricity which is generated using fossil fuels. The other problems are it's quite hard to find. The hydrogen needs to be compressed. Which is a problem because it will be explosive. It also needs a very, very large tank to store it in. And they don't work at low temperatures. At the negative electrode, we are going to have hydrogen gas minus two electrons turning into hydrogen ions. At the positive electrode, we are going to have these hydrogen ions reacting with the oxygen gas and some electrons, and they are then going to turn into the water.